So, uh, as you guys know, this session is being conducted by the Academy X. We are one of the leading academies. We've been having over 15 years of experience in teaching IGPC A levels as well as your IB syllabus. I am your teacher, Ms. Fatma. I have been teaching uh, physics, biology, chemistry, IGCSE for over 10 plus years now. It's really nice to have you all here. I hope. I hope we'll go ahead and have a very good session. We'll go over some really important topics today. Uh, basically, we will take a look at three major topics that you guys have in your syllabus. Uh, electricity, obviously, which I feel is one of the hardest topics in the syllabus. Thermal physics, and obviously, we have the topic of waves. And if we get time towards the end, we will also go over general physics a bit. And mainly today, we're going to concentrate on how to solve past paper questions. Because in physics, just during the theory is not enough. You have to know how to solve your past paper questions. So let's go ahead and get started off with our session for today. So first thing is first, we are going to go ahead and start off with our topic of electricity. Okay, so electricity, I can divide the topic into three portions, electrical quantities, right? There's some really important electrical quantities you guys have to know about. We have, um, obviously, electrical circuits, parallel circuits, series circuits, how to solve them. And obviously, uh, um, uh, we have the, uh, uh, so uh, these are topics that we have to go ahead and we have to go over. So let's go ahead and start off with our electrical quantities. Uh, in electrical quantities, the quantities that you need to know are Charge, current, voltage, resistance. Resistivity, we'll also go ahead and take a look at power, efficiency. We'll take a look at our uh, resistors, variable resistors, fixed resistors. What are the current and voltage graph going to look like? And of course, we'll also go over electromagnetic induction, the generator and the motor principle. So let's first go ahead and start off with a few quantities that are important for you guys to know. So the first quantity that we have to discuss is electrical charge, right? When we talk about electrical charge, how can we define or how can we explain what is electrical charge? Electrical charge is actually the property of a matter, right? It's a property of a matter. And what is it actually about? It is actually about the force that any particle experiences when you put it in a magnetic field. That's what it is actually is. What is charge? Charge is a property of any matter, any particle that leads to a force whenever you will put it in an electrical field. So if you have any particle, you place it in electro electromagnetic field and it experiences a force that that particle must have a charge on it. That's how you define an electrical charge. Charge is measured in coulombs. Please keep in mind that coulombs is a derived unit. It's not a base unit. What is base unit? You guys need to know seven base units, okay? Base units include, for mass, we have kilograms. For time, we have seconds. For temperature, we have Kelvin. For amount of a substance, if you want to talk about the amount of a substance, we have moles, right? Then for current, we have amperes. Then we have one that is for measuring uh, luminosity, the brightness of anything, which is candela. But you guys are not going to be dealing with that in your syllabus, right? These are the units that you guys are going to encounter quite a lot in your syllabus. These are base units, okay? 
any units other than this. Any units other than this are units that are derived units. Okay. You guys will study this topic in greater detail when you just do this. I teach this in much detail when I do, when I teach my eleven students. So yes, another unit that you need to know is the for distance or length, which is meter. These are the only units that are base units, okay? So, for example, Newton. Newton is not an SI base unit. Newton is a derived unit, right? So, I can take these base units and I can make Newton, right? Similarly, Coulomb is a derived unit. It's not a base unit. Voltage is a derived unit. It's not a base unit. So, electrical charge, the unit for that is Coulombs. And if you, now, when it comes to electrical charge, there are two formulas that you need to know. In the entire topic of electricity, in fact, for every quantity, you will encounter two, three different formulas. So, make sure, my advice to you guys, my tip to you guys, make a formula sheet. In that formula sheet, write down every single formula that you know in the entire a physics topic okay it'll make it so much easier for you guys to one learn them and two to solve your questions so for current the uh, charge there are two formulas that you guys are going to encounter in fact the three formulas you guys are going to encounter right so do, do remember that just because i'm telling you one formula right now that does not mean you will not be seeing other formulas related to it okay now you can find out what is the charge of any material by Finding the number of electrons or the number of charged particles. The number of charged particles can be positive as well. So you can find the total number of charged particles and multiply it by the charge of one single electron. The charge of one single electron is 1.6 into 10 raised to the power of minus 19 coulombs. This is the charge of one single electron. Okay. So if I take the total number of any electrons or positive ions or negative ions in any material and I multiply it by the charge of one electron, I will be able to find the total charge on that material in coulombs. So this is one of the electrical quantities that you guys should know, definition, unit, and how to calculate. Then Another electrical quantity which you guys might be more familiar with is current. Current is the rate of flow of charged particles. Please keep in mind that the definition says charged particles, not necessarily electrons, right? And I will give, I'll explain this point to you guys. I don't know if you guys have ever thought of this before or not. A lot of you probably are doing your chemistry as well. A lot of you probably were there for my chemistry session as well. In chemistry, when you study the topic of electrolysis, right, the electrical current flows through the solution, but the positive ions and the negative ions are the ones that are moving, right? So current is basically the rate of flow of charged particles, not necessary electrons, right? The definition is rate of flow of charged particles. The unit for current is amperes. Right, and this is the formula that you guys probably have encountered quite commonly, which actually says that current is equals to charge divided by time. So, if you take the total charge of any material divided by the time taken, you will be able to calculate the value of current. So, current is simply how fast the charge particles are moving, that's what current is how fast your charged particles are moving. And current is measured in amperes. And amperes is a base unit. So we have current. The third important quantity that you guys should know how to calculate and how to define is voltage, right? When we talk about voltage, Voltage is the energy transferred per unit charge. So voltage is all about how much energy a battery or a power supply, whatever it is, how much energy is that battery transferring per unit charge? So for one charge particle, how much energy is that battery transferring? That will be voltage of the battery, right? So when you're seeing that, oh, this is a battery for 12 volts, 
you know that what is it telling you? It's telling you the amount of energy per unit charge. In one charge particle, this is the amount of energy that is going to be carried out. That is what voltage is, right? Voltage is measured in volts. And when we talk about voltage, there are two ways to calculate voltage. Either you can use voltage is equals to energy divided by charge. So you find out the total energy, you find out the total charge, you'll divide them and you should be able to find out what is voltage, right? In case that energy is not provided to you, you can also use work done. Voltage is equals to work done per unit charge. Again, an important concept that I want you guys to link. Please remember energy and work done are always equal to each other. If you guys are solving even general physics questions and you guys find yourself encountering the topic of energy and let's say that they have not given you any information that you require to calculate energy. Do not get confused. See if you can calculate work done. Right? If you can calculate work done, then that's the same thing as calculating energy. So remember this, sometimes in the questions, they are not going to give you energy. They will expect you to calculate work done and use that to find what your energy is. So energy and work done are equal to each other. So you can either define energy voltage as energy per unit charge, or if you say work done per unit charge, you would also be completely correct. Right? The energy, of course, is in joules, the charge is in coulombs, and your voltage is going to be in volts. So that's the third electrical quantity that is important for us to understand. Then another important quantity that we need to understand is resistance. Now, I don't know if you guys have ever thought about resistance in detail, right? What is resistance? Resistance, quite simply put, is the opposition to electrical current. If I am opposing the electrical current, right? If I am opposing the flow of charged particles, if I am opposing the flow of electrons, I am resisting. That's what resistance is. Resistance is the measure of opposition to electrical current. The resistance is the measure of opposition to the flow of electrical current right? It is measured in ohms. Now, this much you might probably have already studied before. One thing that I don't know if you ever thought about is the definition is there. Yes, but what actually is resistance? What do we mean by opposition to electrical current? To understand this, we need to go ahead and take a look at something. This is something I also normally teach in A-levels, uh, but it really helps clear up, clear up some really important concepts. So, what is happens is, what is the flow of current? When I connect a battery, so whenever you connect a battery, you will connect the battery to the wire. One side of the wire will be connected to the negative terminal of the battery. The other side of the wire is going to be connected to the positive terminal of the battery. What is going to happen? That the electrons in the wire, in your conductor, they will be repelled from the negative end and they will be attracted towards the positive end. So they will move from the negative terminal of the battery to the positive terminal of the battery. And as those electrons will flow, electrical current is going to be generated. Now, when we talk about resistance, as these electrons are going to be flowing through the metal. Now, if you remember your chemistry, if you have gone through chemistry, you might have studied metallic bonding. A metal is made up of positive ions surrounded by a sea of delocalized electrons. So these electrons have a lot of sort of obstacles in their way. As these electrons are going to be flowing, they are going to be bumping a lot into each other. They will be bumping, they will be colliding with the positive ions. And as they're going to bump, as they're going to collide with each other, they will lose a little bit of energy and they will slow down. That is resistance, right? Because flowing of the electrons was electrical current. But if the electrons will slow down, they're not moving that fast anymore. The current is now 
lesser. So the opposition of electrical current is what resistance is. And this is the logic behind resistance, that the electrons, as they collide with each other, as they bump into each other, they tend to lose a little bit of the energy and they tend to become slow down. So they're not moving that fast anymore. This is the logic behind resistance. And when I explain to you the concept of filament bulb, the concept of resistivity, you will see how everything links back to this concept. So resistance is the opposition to flow of, of electrical current. It is measured in ohms. Now, ohms, the scientist was the first one to actually, uh, or not the first one, but the first person to come up with a explanation of the relationship of resistance and other electrical quantities. So Ohm's law states, what, the, what did Ohm state? State, he stated that current and voltage are directly proportional to each other. Now, when we talk about directly proportional, what does this term mean? Directly proportional, okay, so if I asked you guys, what does directly proportional mean? And you said, if uh, voltage increases, current increases. That's not good enough. That's not what directly proportional means. Directly proportional means that if current will double, voltage will also double. If current will triple, voltage will also triple. That's directly proportional. If one quantity doubles, the other one also has to double, right? If one quantity doubles, but the other quantity triples, they're both increasing, but that's not directly proportional, right? So current and voltage are directly proportional to each other provided, so there is a criteria. Resistance and temperature have to remain constant. If the resistance or the temperature is changing, current and voltage will no longer be directly proportional. That's the criteria especially resistance. Resistance cannot change. If the resistance of any electrical supply uh, appliance or the resistance of any electrical component remains constant, current and voltage will be directly proportional to each other. Right? And if we take it in the form of our mathematical relationship, so this is the equation that we have. V is equals to IR. This is the most common equation that is used a lot whenever you're solving your past paper questions. V, of course, is your voltage in volts. I is your current in amperes. And R is, a, R is resistance in your ohms. So when uh, we're going to go ahead and talk about it, and this is what the graph is going to look like when you go ahead and you... Uh, when you go ahead and you plot your information. If you plot a graph of voltage and current, you are going to end up seeing a graph that looks something like this, okay? Now, do not take a look at the graph that they have given. In fact, do not take a look at this one. Take a look at this one. Over here, this is the graph. This graph has current on the y-axis and voltage on the x-axis. Now, as you can see, we have a directly proportional relationship. How can you look at a graph and tell if the relationship is directly proportional or not? There are two criteria for that. One, you must have a straight line. And secondly, that straight line must be going through the origin. So if you have a straight line going through the origin, then you have a, then the electrical component is falling Ohm's law. Voltage and current are directly proportional to each other. Voltage and current are directly proportional to each other. And this is what the graph is going to look like. We have voltage on the x-axis and current on the y-axis. Okay. Now, when you talk about how you can calculate resistance from this graph, okay? If you want to calculate resistance from this graph, you can calculate it with the help of gradient of the line. You can use the gradient of the line to help you calculate the resistance. How are you going to use the gradient of the line? The if you take the gradient of the line and you reciprocate it, meaning that you take the gradient of the line and you do one upon gradient, whatever the numerical value gradient is, 
you put it in the denominator, you do one upon gradient, you will be able to calculate the resistance, right? This is from a current voltage graph. Current voltage graph, right? This is the graph that you guys will encounter quite commonly in your past paper exams with current on the y-axis, voltage on the x-axis, right? And if current is on the y-axis, please pay attention to exactly what I'm saying. If current is on the y-axis, in that case, use the formula I have provided. Calculate the gradient of the graph and take out the reciprocal. That is going to be equal to the resistance of that, of that electrical component. Now, this is the common graph that you see. Sometimes, though, you might see a graph that looks like this. The graph that you see over here, it has voltage on the y-axis, right? This graph has current on the y-axis. This graph has voltage on the y-axis. So, you will. this is the graph you will encounter most commonly, this one where current is on the y-axis. This is the one you guys will actually find quite a lot in your past papers. But I also want to inform you guys, you will see questions where voltage is on the y-axis. If voltage is on the y-axis, then the way of calculating your resistance is slightly different. Okay? So... If voltage is on the y-axis, and I hope you guys are noting this down, if voltage is on the y-axis, then the gradient is directly equal to resistance. If current is on the x-axis, then please use one upon gradient to find the resistance. If voltage is on the y-axis, like this graph, in that case, the gradient is directly equal to the resistance of the electrical component. So whenever you guys are finding yourself looking at a voltage current graph, Please first look, take a look at what is on the y-axis. This is what you will do if current is on the y-axis. And this is what you will do if voltage, voltage is the one that's on y-axis. So this is what your graph is going to look like, right? This is what your graph is exactly going to look like for. And current voltage is the one you'll find very commonly. This is what the graph is going to look like. Directly proportional relationship, 1 upon G is equal to the resistance of the electrical component. Now, when we talk about our resistors, right? You guys need to know that we can classify resistors into two categories. We can have fixed resistors or we can have variable resistors. Fixed resistors are those resistors that follow Ohm's law, meaning that their resistance is constant. It will not change, right? Throughout the entire electrical circuit, throughout the entire process, the resistance is not going to change. It's known as a fixed resistor, okay? But we can have resistors that are considered as variable resistors, meaning that their resistance is going to change, right? And hence, they do not fall follow Ohm's law. So we cannot use Ohm's law to solve questions related to variable resistance. And that's why you're not going to find yourself uh, dealing with questions related to variable resistors. Uh, you'll only deal with simple calculations, right? Now, when we talk about variable resistors, variable resistors can further be classified into four categories. We can have a filament bulb, we can have a diode, we can have a thermistor, or we can have a light-dependent resistor. We are going to go over all four options one by one, right? Okay. Let's first talk about a filament bulb. Over here, if you see the graph that is in front of you, you will see this is a current voltage graph, okay? In a current voltage graph, what did I tell you? 1 upon G is equals to R in a current voltage graph, right? Please make sure you remember this. Now, what is happening in a filament uh, lamp, lamp graph? First of all, you can see we do not have a straight line. We have a curve. So obviously, the resistance is changing, right? Now, if you take a look at the gradient of the line, you will notice that the gradient of the curve, so we can calculate the gradient of the curve by making a tangent, right? So you will see that if you draw a tangent at multiple points, you will see that as you go along, the gradient of the line is uh, decreasing, 
right? The gradient of the line is actually decreasing. Now, we know that 1 upon gradient is equal to resistance, right? Gradient and resistance are inversely proportional. They have an inverse relationship. So, if the gradient is decreasing, that means resistance is increasing. In a filament lamp, the resistance increases. Remember that. In a filament lamp, the resistance increases. Why? Why is the resistance of a filament lamp increasing? The reason for that, again, I can explain to you guys using the concept of resistance. What is going to happen? That when you are going to increase the voltage, electrical current will also increase, right? We know that. As the electrical current will increase, the electrons will start to move faster and faster and faster and faster. As those electrons are going to start moving faster, they are going to gain kinetic energy. They will start colliding, bumping, running into each other a lot more often, right? If you have a bunch of people walking slowly, they are less likely to run into each other. They're probably going to travel, you know, in a straight manner. But for example, what happens in a mob, right? What happens in a mob or what happens when a place is overcrowded, there are more chances of you bumping into each other. Same thing applies to electrons. The more voltage you're going to provide to the filament lamp, the more current is going to be there. The more current is going to be there, there are two logics behind this. First of all, current uh, leads to increase in temperature. And then also current will increase the flow of electrons. The electrons are flowing faster and they're gaining kinetic energy. So as a result, they will bump and collide into each other more often, even more than before. Hence, they will flow down. So, since they're slowing down, resistance is increasing. That's the reason why in a filament bulb, bulb resistance increases as you increase the voltage. Because the electrons will move faster, they'll gain kinetic energy, and hence they will collide and bump into each other even more often. And in the process, they will slow down, so the resistance of the filament bulb increases. This is the reason why a filament bulb gives you a graph of this shape. You have a curved graph, right? Now, another important uh, resistor that you guys should know about is a diode. A diode is a resistor that only allows the electrical current to pass in one direction. To understand this concept, we have to understand that we have two types of currents that you might find see in your uh, that you might see in your electrical system. We can have direct current and we can have alternating current. Okay? Alternating current is the current that is produced from your generators. We will go over the topic of electromagnetic induction and generators. So we will take a look into this. In alternating current, what happens? That current is a vector quantity. So in alternating current, the current produced is traveling in both directions, forward as well as backwards, forward as well as backwards, right? The graph looks something like this, positive, negative, positive, negative. Positive and negative does not mean that the value is becoming neg negative. It simply means that the direction of the current is changing, right? This is alternating current. So what is a diode going to do? It will only allow the current to pass in in one direction. So it will only, for example, allow the current to pass in the forward direction. This is the symbol of a diode, by the way. It will only allow the current to pass, for example, in the forward direction. If the current travels in the reverse direction, in the backwards direction, it will not be allowed to pass through. Hence, if you take a look over here, you will see when the voltage is negative, the current is zero. And when the voltage becomes positive, the current increases very rapidly within the diode. There is the reason for that. And the reason for it is a, what is a diode made up of? A diode is not made up of a conductor. It's not made up of some kind of metal. Like a filament lamp, it's made up of a metal wire. 
uh, your normal resistors, they have metal components. But a semiconductor diode is not made up of a metal. Instead, it is made up of a material known as semiconductor. A semiconductor is a material that conducts electricity partially, only up to a certain extent, right? So, since it's a semiconductor, it will only conduct the electrical current in one direction. You will study semiconductors in greater detail when you do your A-levels. I teach this in my A-levels. So, you will study this in much greater detail then. So in a semiconductor diode, you'll see that when voltage is negative, there's going to be no flow of electrical current. Then as soon as the voltage becomes positive, the electrical current will increase. And then we have thermistor or light dependent resistor. Both of them give you similar graphs. That's why I did not make them separately. In a thermistor, what happens that both thermistor and your light dependent resistors are basically can act as sensors okay i'll explain what i mean by that in just a second firstly in thermistor so in thermistor what happens that as temperature increases the resistance of the thermistor will decrease or as the temperature of a thermistor will decrease the resistance will increase so in a thermistor the resistance does not depend upon voltage or current or anything like that it will depend upon the temperature of its surroundings. So based on the temperature of the surroundings, the resistance of the thermistor can increase or it can decrease. Similarly, LDR or light dependent resistor does the same thing, but with light. If the intensity of the light falling on the LDR is great, the resistance will be low. And if the light intensity decreases on the LDR, the resistance will increase. And so again, for an LDR, the change in resistance is not related to voltage and current. It's related to an external environment. It's related to the light that is falling on that electrical component. And keep this in mind that they can act as sensors, meaning that let's say, I, I have a, a, a refrigerator, okay? I can set up the thermistor in such a way that if the temperature of the refrigerator starts to increase, for example, somebody left the door open and now the refrigerator is heating up. So the refrigerator can start to beep, it can start to produce an alarm so that it can be notified that the temperature has been increased. Another major example, it's used in fire alarms, thermistors, right? That's how they're able to sense the change in temperature and that's one of the reasons how they're able to actually uh, activate the for example the sprinkler system similarly ldrs are often used in burglar alarms right where uh, if uh, any light will turn on the alarm turns to go off so the you have thermistor and you have ldr these are also both classified as variable res resistors so this is uh, the four types of resistors that you guys are going to find yourself encountering in your past paper questions. So far, does anybody have any question? I hope everything is making sense. Would anybody like to ask anything? All right, great. Now, when we talk about resistivity, resistivity, again, is something that is related to resistance. Now, resistivity is actually the, the property of a material. Think of it this way. This is the uh, inherent resistance of any conductor or the internal resistance of any conductor. I'll explain this to you. What I mean by this. Let's say that we have two metals. One is zinc, one is copper. By the way, I'm simplifying the concept quite a lot, right? Because we are, again, short on time. Normally in class, I explain this very properly. But I have simplified this concept for you guys. So we have copper and we have zinc, okay? Copper will have a different number of electrons. It will have a different number of positive ions. It will have a different density. Everything will be different. 
Then we have zinc. Zinc has different number of electrons, different number of positive ions, different density, different spacing between the ions. Everything is different. Now, in copper, let's say that the number of electrons are greater. So in copper, since the number of electrons are greater, they're more likely to run into each other. They're more likely to collide into each other. They're more likely to bump into each other. And hence, copper might have higher resistance compared to zinc, right? So this, this internal resistance, this inherent resistance is resistivity. Resistivity is the property of my material. It's a property of the material. So copper has its own value of resistance. That is resistivity. Zinc will have a different value of resistance. That is resistivity. If I take the same amount of copper and same amount of zinc, I apply the same voltage, but copper will give me different resistance and zinc will give me a different value. Why? Because there are two different materials. So the property of the material is resistivity. Resistivity is a property of the material. What does that mean? That means that if I make two wires, both of them are copper. One is longer, one is shorter. The resistivity, not the resistance, the resistivity will be the same because both the wires are made of the same material. Both the wires are made up of copper, right? So that is something that we have to understand. Resistivity is a property of the material and it will remain the same as long as the material is the same, okay? Material and temperature and few other things, but for our case, as long as the material is the same, right? So, when we talk about resistance, okay, the overall resistance of any wire, any electrical component depends upon three things. It obviously depends upon what is the material the wire is made up of. Is it made up of copper, zinc, is it uh, aluminum, is it iron, what is it? Is it steel? It depends upon the, it depends upon the material that it is made up of, right? The uh, when we talk about resistivity, so resistivity is the property of material. So resistivity, then resistance depends upon the length. The longer the length, the higher the resistance will be. And this is easy to understand if, again, we consider this diagram. If the length is longer, the electrons have to cover more distance. And if the electrons have to cover more distance, then, of course, there's more chances that they're going to collide with each other and they will slow down, right? So that is resistance is uh, directly proportional to length. And it is inversely proportional to area. Again, we can understand looking at this graph. If you have a narrow wire, right? What is going to happen that the electrons are not going to have a lot of space to move. Since the electrons are not going to have a lot of space to move, so what is going to happen? That they are going to collide and bump into each other a lot more often. So if the area is lesser, the resistance is likely to be high. On the other hand, if you have a large area of the wire, the electrons have a lot more space to move around. So obviously, they are going to collide a lot lesser, they will lose less energy, they'll be able to move much better. So if the area is high, the resistance is low. And you can find out the area of any wire by using pi r square, the cross-sectional area. You can find it out by using pi r square. So this is the formula that we finally derived of resistance. Resistance is equals to resistivity. Resistivity is the property of the material multiplied by length of the wire divided by area of the wire. And so this formula is very important because you get quite a lot of interesting questions related to, and I'll see, uh, if I can find it, I'll go over it with you guys as well, where they will give you two different wires, two different lengths, two different areas, and they will ask you to calculate the resistance or they'll ask you to calculate the ratio of resistance, right? So this is a, a very important formula. Then another really important formula that you guys need to know about is power. Power is a topic that you guys will encounter in your general physics as well as in the topic of electricity. 
Quite simply put, power is the energy transferred per unit time, or you can say work done per unit time. So either you can say power is energy per unit time or work done per unit time because energy and work done are always equal to each other. So power, of course, is measured in watts. Energy or work done, doesn't matter what it is, will be in joules and time is going to be in seconds. This is a formula you guys must have done from your topic of general physics. Now, we can use this concept to actually get the formulas related to electricity. How, do, how can I do that? I can take the formula that you guys have studied in general physics and I can get the formulas related to the topic of electricity. How do we do that? Let me go with that with you. So we know that power is equals to energy upon time. We know that when we talk about energy, so energy upon charge is equals to voltage, right? So let's rearrange the equation and make energy our subject. So energy is equals to voltage multiplied by current, uh, multiplied by charge. Sorry. All right. Let's substitute this in our equation. So power is equals to voltage into current divided by time. Current upon time. Hmm. We have studied this formula somewhere. Current is equals to charge upon time. Right. So I can substitute this in the formula. So my formula becomes power is equals to voltage into current. And this is the formula that you guys must have studied so many times, right? Power is equals to voltage into current. So if I want to find out the power of any electrical appliances, I can find out by using the formula power is equals to voltage multiplied by the current. Now, shortcut. Not exactly a shortcut. I'm sure you must have studied the shortcut, but in case you haven't, it will help you out. Sometimes when you're solving the past paper questions, you'll see that voltage is not given to you or current is not given to you. Now, in this case, you have two options. Option number one is that you calculate the current or you calculate the voltage and then you use the formula power is equals to VI and get the answer. Or... Option number two, you can use alternate formulas. The alternate formulas are power is equals to voltage square upon resistance. Let's say that you have not been given current in your question. You have voltage, you have resistance, you don't have current. So option number one is you use Ohm's law. You find the value of current, you put that in the formula, you get the answer. Or you use the alternate. In this case, you don't need to worry about calculating current. You can directly take the voltage, directly take the resistance, put it in the formula, calculate your power, right? Similarly, if you are dealing with current, you can calculate it by using power is equals to current squared multiplied by resistance. So if you don't have voltage, the only information you have is current and resistance. You can use this alternate formula to calculate the power of any electrical component. So for power, you should know four formulas. Formula number one, power is equals to energy or work done. Please keep that in mind upon time. Power is equals to voltage into current. And power is equals to V square upon R or I square into R. Right, four formulas for power that you guys should note down in your formula sheet, and this will make it easy for you to choose exactly which formula to use when solving your or practicing your past paper questions. Then, another really important electrical quantity that we have to talk about is efficiency. Efficiency is simply you can uh, think of it this way: is Uh, when we are going to go ahead and talk about it, it is simply how good a machine is in taking the input and converting it into output, right? How good a machine is in taking in the input and converting it into an output. But 
for the output, it has to be useful output. Useful output is the output that is desired. For example, I have a filament bulb or I have a lamp. The useful output is light. I want that bulb to be producing light. Wasted output will be heat energy. I do not want the bulb, uh, bulb to be heating up. I don't want the heat energy. I want light. I, I mean, obviously, the heat energy is still going to be there. I can't stop it, but that's wasted. So when I took a talk about efficiency, it's how good is my bulb from taking the electrical energy, right? Converting into light energy. That's efficiency. The more efficient my bulb is going to be, more of the electrical energy will be converted into light energy. The less efficient it is going to be. So what's going to happen? That most of the electrical energy will be wasted away as heat energy and only a small quantity of it is actually going to convert into light energy. So efficiency is how good a machine is in taking the input and converting it into useful output. You can calculate the energy uh, efficiency by either taking energy or with power. You can calculate it using both. So either you can take a look at the useful output energy in our example, light energy, and divide it by the total input energy. So that would be electrical energy. Then we can have useful power output and divide it by the total power input. Both of these situations, you, uh, you can use energy as well as power. The formula will remain the same. It's output over input. Useful output over total input. So this is uh, our electrical quantities that you had to know. Now, before uh, uh, the next part of your topic of electrical quantities is uh, or electricity is electrical circuits, right? When it comes to electrical circuits, you have two major circuits in your syllabus. You have series circuits and parallel circuits. Practicing these circuits is very important because you guys probably know this. And this is the reason I'm going over this topic first is because you even in your paper two, you get a lot of questions, MCQs related to electricity. In your paper four, there's always at least at least one question, sometimes two, mostly two, in fact, related to the topic of electricity, right? So you guys, in the topic of electricity, electrical circuits are quite important. So let's go ahead and first discuss what are the rules for solving questions about series circuits and parallel circuits. And then we're actually going to take a look at past paper questions and see how we can solve questions. Because in physics, like I said, the main thing is to know how you are going to answer questions, right? Now, when it comes to series circuits and parallel circuits, to be very honest, if you talk about a simple diagram, the rules are easy to understand. Where does this topic get confusing? This topic gets confusing when you take a look at combination circuits. In combination circuits, you will also have series and you will also have parallel. So that's where it gets con confusing. How are you going to solve that? So before we take a look at that, let's first talk about what is a series circuit and what is a parallel circuit. In a series circuit, what is going to happen? All of the electrical components whether they are resistors, whether they are thermistors, whether they are uh, a filament bulb, whether they are any other uh, electrical component, those electrical component are all going to be connected in one straight line. What does that mean? That means that when the current is going to flow through the wire, it will only have one path. That's it. The current has only one path available. So the current can only go in this direction that's it the current cannot travel in any other direction so all the resistors are connected in one path they're connected in one line right the current does not have the option of going anywhere else the current is only got one path to travel in a parallel circuit the resistors are connected in such a way that the current has multiple paths available so the current for example can go to r1 and then it also has the option of going to R2 and it also has the option of going to R3, right? In this particular case, the current only has one pathway. It can go R3, R2, R1. There's nothing else it can do. In a parallel circuit though, current can go 
some of it can go to R1, some of it can go to R2, some of it can go to R3. So in a parallel circuit, the resistors are connected in such a way that current has multiple pathways available. In a series circuit, all of the resistors are connected in such a way that current only has one pathway to pass through. Now, when we talk about the rules, so in a series circuit, what happens that current in all of the resistors will be same. Current will not change. Why? Because current has nowhere else to go. There is literally one path. That's it. That current has one path. It, can, it can't go anywhere else. So that current will be the same. R3, R2, R1. They will all receive the same amount of current because current, the electrons have nowhere else to go. They can only travel in one straight line. They can only travel in one pathway. They have nowhere to go, right? So all of them are going to, uh, all of them are going to have the same value of current. So in a series circuit, current remains the same. Meaning that if you know the R current in R three, then you also know the current in R two. Then you also know the current in R one. Then you also know the input current. You know everything. Right? When we talk about voltage, voltage is divided. Right? What is voltage? voltage? Voltage is energy per unit charge. So the total energy is, for example, 12 volts. Some of that energy will go to R3. Some of that energy will go to R2. Some of that energy will go to R1. Right? Because total energy has to be conserved. Total energy has to be 12. You can't have, um, you can't have energy more than 12. So obviously, if the total energy is 12, then there is no option but for it to be distributed between the three resistors. So in a series circuit, the current is going to be the same in all resistors. A but voltage is going to be different. And I can take the voltage in R3, in R2, and in R1. I can add it all up and it will give me the total voltage. So I can actually take the voltage in all three resistors and I will be able to find out what is the total voltage, right? So that's the rule for your series. And if in a series circuits, you guys ever want to find out the total resistance, you will add up the values. So if you want to find the total resistance of a series circuits, simply add up the value. R1 plus R2 plus R3, right? You add up all the values, you will be able to find the total resistance. You want to find the total voltage? Find the voltage in all three resistors and add them up. You want to find the total current? Well, this is easy. The total current is going to be the same throughout. Now, in a parallel circuit, what happens? That current does not remain the same current gets divided because those electrons have multiple places to go. So what's going to happen? Let's say that R1 has very high resistance. R2 has low resistance. So the electrons will say, oh, the R1, there's so much resistance in the way. Think of it like a blockade, right? You guys have got two routes available. So if you've got two routes available, you will say, okay, route number one, I can see so much traffic. I might as well go through route number two. Right? And that's exactly what will happen over here. The electrons will say, oh, root number one, so such high resistance, let's choose root number two. So you will see that most of the current will go through root two, some of it will go through R1. Right? So in a parallel circuit, because electrons have multiple pathway options, the current gets divided. Right? So in a series in a series circuit, current remains the same. In a parallel circuit, current is going to get divided. So I can, if I want to find the total current, I will take the current in resistor one, in resistor two, in resistor three, and I will add it up. I will add up all the currents and I will get the total current. Now, when it comes to voltage, voltage remains the same. All three of them receive the same amount of energy. Okay? All three of them remain this, receive the same amount of energy because the thing what is happening is current is decreasing. Right? So the electrons are for uh, moving with less speed, right? So what is going to happen that the voltage will remain the same. In series circuit, current remains the same. In parallel circuits, voltage remains the same. Voltage will not change, okay? 
So R1 will receive the same voltage, R2 will receive the same voltage, and R3 will receive the same voltage. Then when it comes to calculate your resistance, so you can calculate your resistance by using this formula. 1 upon R1, so you will take resistance 1 and you will do 1 upon R1 plus 1 upon R2 plus 1 upon R3. And this will give you 1 upon total resistance. Please keep in mind that the answer you get is 1 upon total resistance. Okay? What does that mean? That means that, so let's say that you got the answer 1 upon 2. Remember, this is not the answer. This is the value for 1 upon R. You want the value for R. So you have to flip it upside down. You'll flip it upside down. So it will become, if you flip it upside down, it will become 2 upon 1. So that's the actual resistance. The resistance is 2, right? So you can find out the resistance of a parallel circuit by using the formula 1 upon total resistance is equal to 1 upon R1 plus 1 upon R2 plus 1 upon R3. And in a series circuit, current remains the same, but voltage is added up. In a parallel circuit, the current is added up, but voltage remains the same. Now, solving questions, uh, I feel like for at least simple series circuits or parallel circuit is not that confusing. But when you take a combination circuit in which you also have a series circuit and also have a parallel circuit, that, that is where it tends to be slightly confusing in terms of calculation. So, we are going to go ahead and actually take a look at some questions on how to solve the topic that we have covered so far. Meanwhile, does anybody have any confusion, any questions, anything that's not clear? Let me know in the chat if anybody has any questions that they would like to ask. We're going to go ahead and practice some questions together. We're going to go ahead and take a look at that. We're going to practice some questions together. Uh, I'll solve them with you. I would absolutely love it if you guys solve them with me. Okay, perfect. If there are no questions, let's go ahead. And so this is exactly what I meant by a combination circuit, right? A combination circuit is a circuit. If you take a look over here, you will see that we also have a parallel circuit. Then we have a mini parallel circuit. And then we have a series circuit, right? So this is a combination circuit. So how are we going to solve questions related to uh, questions like this? Okay. First of all, always identify the major circuit. What is the bigger circuit? Okay. The bigger circuit is a parallel circuit. Okay. <coughs> then inside the parallel circuit, I have a smaller parallel circuit and a smaller series circuit. Right. Now, the question that they're asking us, please, I calculate the current in the 8 ohm resistor. This is 8 ohm resistor. We have to calculate the current in the 8 ohm resistor. Now, what does this mean? We know that this is a parallel circuit. In a parallel circuit, if the voltage is going to be the same. So, the voltage that is coming over here, the voltage that is coming over here, and the voltage that is coming over here is going to be the same. Right? So, when we are going to talk about it, what does that mean? That means that the voltage in this branch will also be 12 volts. The voltage in this branch will also be 12 volts. The voltage in this branch will also be 12 volts. Once you guys have, th this is step number one, right? 
go over your circuits, go over your rules and try to solve it. That's the first thing you're going to do. After doing that, what are you going to do? Write down your data. You have the voltage, 12 volts. The resistance, if you take a look at the diagram, is 8 ohms. What formula should I use to calculate the current? What do you guys think? We have voltage and we have resistance. What formula can I use? Of all the formulas that we went through, which one can I use over here? That will give me the value that I require. Yes, exactly. You can use V is equals to IR, right? So rearrange the formula to make current the subject. Voltage upon resistance gives us current. That's very good. Now, can you calculate the value for me? What is our current going to be? Yes, perfectly correct, 1.5 amperes. Okay, this was actually an easy solution. Let me give you guys a bit of a brain tracer, okay? So, we already know that we've got 12 volts going in this arm. We've got 12 volts going here. We've got 12 volts going here, and we've got 12 volts going here. What if I asked you guys to find the current in the 5 ohm resistor? Does anybody have any idea what I can do over here? Now what? What are we going to do now? Yes, current will remain the same. So whatever is the current in uh, your 5 ohm resistor, this one will also receive the same current, correct? But it will not be 1.5 amperes. Why? Because this 8 ohm resistor is in parallel to the 5 ohm resistor, right? Can you see that this 8 ohm resistor is in parallel with the 5 ohm resistor? So the current will not be 1.5. These two are in parallel to each other. So this branch is getting 1.5 amperes. But the other branches will get a different value of current depending upon resistance. See, this is exactly what I'm trying to say. That in combination circuits, we have to exactly break it down. So in our case, you can see that the 8 ohm resistor is not in series with the 5 ohm resistor. These 5 ohm resistor are in series, yes. So whatever is the current in one 5 ohm, the current in the other 5 ohm will be the same, true. But they are not in series with the 8 ohm resistor. They are in parallel with the 8 ohm resistor. So it will definitely not be 1.5 amperes. So now what are you going to do? My advice in questions like these, find the combined resistance of the bottom branch, okay? We know that the resistance over here is 8 ohms. So let's find the total resistance of the lower branch, okay? We have 5 ohms and we have 5 ohms. They are both in series with each other. What will be the total resistance if they're both in series with each other, the 5 ohm resistor? What do we do when we are adding up resistance in a series circuit? 
what formula do we use? We use resistance is equals to R1 plus R2 plus R3, so on and so forth, right? So we have, so we have five ohms and we have five ohms. That gives us a total of 10 ohms, okay? So I'm going to, what you're going to do is that you're going to find the total resistance. So the total resistance is 10 ohms. Now, what is the voltage? The voltage that is in the entire branch from here to here, okay? In the entire branch, the voltage is 12 volts, okay? The current, we don't know. The total resistance is 10 ohms. So 12 divided by 10 gives you 1.2 ohms. So the current that we will see in the 5 ohm resistor is going to be 1.2 amperes, both of them. Both of them will give you a value of 1.2 amperes, right? So over here, we have to understand that even though these two are in series with each other, but they are parallel to the 8 ohm resistor. So we have to keep both of the circuits in our mind. So the current that both of them will receive is going to be 1.2 amperes, right? That's how you guys are going to go ahead and solve questions like this. Now, another brain teaser for you guys, taking a look at the same question, okay? So I have told you that the current is going to be 1.2 amperes. What if I asked you to find the voltage? What is the voltage? over here across the 5 ohm resistor. Can you guys find out what should be the voltage across the 5 ohm resistor? Yes, correct, Samira, good job. So you will get 6 volts over here and 6 volts over here. And the total is equal to 12. Right? Perfect. Now, so over here, the 8 ohm resistor is getting 1.5 ampere current, 12 volts voltage. In this particular case, both of them will get 1.2 amperes current, but the voltage will be divided because they are in series with each other. Now, come to the top branch. In the top branch, let's say I ask you to calculate the current across the 4 ohm resistor. What are you going to do? If I ask you to calculate the current in the 4 ohm resistor, can somebody tell me what we will do? What do you guys think? What should we do? Again, you have got two resistors. Whenever you have guys have two resistors like this, what do you do? I told you guys to calculate the total resistance, right? Even for the 5 ohm resistor, we calculated the total resistance. So over here, we will also calculate total resistance. Now, both of them are in, both of them are in parallel with each other, right? How do we calculate the total resistance in a parallel circuit? Does anybody remember the formula? This is the formula, right? So you are going to do 1 upon 4 plus 1 upon 4, which will, of course, give you 2 upon 4, right? Or it will give you, if you cancel it out, you get 1 upon 2. Now, 1 upon 2 is equals to 1 upon R, like I said, right? So you have to flip it upside down to get the value of R. So you will get 2 upon 1, which is 2 ohms. So the resistance, the total resistance over here is 2 ohms. Okay? So if 
uh, when we are going to go ahead and we are going to uh, uh, talk about it, right? So the total resistance is going to be 4 ohms, okay? Now, over here, uh, what are we going to go ahead and do? We can find out if I ask you, right? What is the, so uh, what are you going to do? You have, you can take your 12 volts, okay? This is how you calculate the total resistance. Now, in this particular case, um, in this particular case, what are we going to do is that we know that the this is the 4 ohm resistor. This 4 ohm resistor is in parallel with another resistor. In a parallel circuit, the voltage remains the same. So this one is also going to get 12 volts. And this one is also going to get 12 volts. Right? In a parallel circuit, the voltage remains the same. So now we know that the car voltage is 12. We know that the resistance is 4. So we can use the formula V is equals to I R. Right? So you will do 12 upon 4 and you will get 3 amperes as your current. Right. So this is how you guys are going to go ahead. And this is how you guys are going to solve your combined circuits. Is this making sense? Do you guys uh, see how we're going to solve questions related uh, like these? Okay, great. All right, so let's go ahead and take a look at another question. Meanwhile, guys, if there is anything that's not making sense, please do let me know. That's exactly why I'm here to help you guys out to make this as easy for you guys as I can. I know physics is a tough subject. It's harder. Uh, uh, if you don't understand the calculations well, it can be confusing. So if anybody does have any questions, do let me know. All right, so now I have another question for you guys that I want you guys to go ahead and solve it with me, okay? Okay, the question says, figure 8.1 shows three cells, each of EMF 1.5 volts connected in series. Calculate the combined EMF of the cell. So what do you guys think? What should be the combined EMF of the cell? It's a one mark question, so it's quite easy. Yes, correct. So you will do 1.5 plus 1.5 plus 1.5. So you will get 4.5. Good job. All right. Next is saying calculate the combined resistance of the three resistors that are shown to you in figure 8.1. So how can I calculate the combined resistance of these three resistors? Yes, good job. Good job, Juliana. So you are going to, first of all, solve the series component, okay? So you are going to do 4 plus 1, that gives you 5. So over here, we are going to have 5, okay? Now, we have, both of these are in parallel with each other. So if you want to find out the total resistance of a parallel circuit, you will do 1 upon 5 plus 1, okay? So take out your LCM, you're going to get one so you will uh uh you're going to take out your lcm right you are going to uh solve your question so you will end up getting five plus one upon five 
So six upon five, right? Which if you go ahead, now keep this in mind that six upon five is the answer for one upon R. So you have to reciprocate it. So it will become five upon six, okay? So that gives you the value of 0 0.83. Good job, well done. Okay, take a look at what they are asking us next. Next, they're asking us, calculate the current in the four ohm resistor. Can you calculate what the current will be in the four ohm resistor? Okay, no. So we can't do uh, uh we can't do uh four point five upon four. There is a reason for that. Reason is this that okay, you are your four point five, right? Four point five is the voltage that you're right, that is the voltage that's going to be going to this entire branch. But if you take a look at just these two resistors, right? These two resistors are in series with each other. So yes, they will be receiving a total of 4.5 because they are in parallel with the 1 ohm resistor. So 4.5 over here and 4.5 over here. But once the 4.5 volts have gone to the top branch, now the resistors are in series with each other. So the voltage will divide. Some of the 4.5 volts will go to resistor 4 ohm and some of it will go to the one ohm resistor. So you can't exactly go 4.5 divided by four, right? Is that making sense? Why we can't go for 4.5 divided by four? Because 4.5 is the voltage that is going to both of, that is the total voltage, okay? But since both of them are in series with each other, so both of them will receive a different value of the voltage. So what are we actually going to go ahead and do? You are going to add up the resistance and calculate the total resistance, okay? So four ohms and one ohms are in series with each other. So total resistance is five ohms, okay? You will use voltage is equals to current into resistance. The total voltage, so see, if I'm using total voltage, I have to use total resistance. Keep that in mind, okay? So total voltage is 4.5. 4.5 is not the voltage in the 4 ohm resistor. That's the total voltage of both the resistors. Is equals to current multiplied by the total resistance. So 4.5 divided by 5 give us 0 0.9 amperes. And since 4 ohms and 1 ohm are in series with each other, so we know that if the total current is 0 0.9, so 4 ohm will also receive 0 0.9 and 1 ohm will also receive 0 0.9. So the current in the 4 ohm resistor will be 0 0.9 amperes, right? This is why you have to uh, remember that the rules, just because they are in parallel with each other, that does not mean that the 4 ohm resistor will get 4.5 volts, okay? Because even though it is in parallel with the 1 ohm, it's in parallel with the 1 ohm, but it is in series with the resistor over here. So the voltage will get divided between these two resistors, right? I hope that's making sense. If there's any confusion, do let me know. Does anybody have any queries, anything that you guys want to ask? Is this all making sense? I hope it's all clear because the numerical portions are really important.
All right. So if uh, you guys are good with the calculations, so now we will go ahead and take a look at the third part related to our topic of electricity, and that is the topic of electromagnetic induction. Electromagnetic induction is actually quite important because obviously it links to your uh, generator, your motor, as well as your transformers. So we will go ahead and we will take a look at all three. We'll take a look at how generators work, how your motors work, how exactly does a transformer work, okay? So this is actually one of the important parts of the topic of electricity so let's go ahead and take a look at exactly what electromagnetic induction is now if you want to understand what electromagnetic induction is one thing that you guys need to realize is your electrical field magnetic fields uh, are always linked with each other what does that mean? That means that whenever you have, have an electrical field, you will also have a magnetic field. Or if you have a magnetic field, you will also have a electrical field. This is a criteria, right? Both of them go hand in hand. And the third criteria is that wherever you will have an electrical field and you will also have a magnetic field, if you place any charged particle in the field, if you place any charged particle in the field, that charged particle will experience a force. And that is exactly what Faraday's law is all about. Whenever you will take any charged particle, you will put it in an electromagnetic field because in electrical field and magnetic field go hand in hand. If you take any charged particle, put it in an electromagnetic field, that particle will experience a force, okay? So that is what Faraday's law is all about. Now, when we, the thing is that it can also go the other way around. If I take a, a charged particle, right? and I apply a magnetic field. If I take a charged particle, I apply a magnetic field, and I move the charged particle, electrical field will be produced, right? So three things go hand in hand. Movement, movement of what? The charged particle. Then your magnetic field, then your electrical field. If you have an electrical field and a magnetic field, then the charged particle will move. If you have a magnetic field and a moving charge particle, an electrical field will be produced, right? So these three things always go hand in hand. If there is two of them, the third one will happen. If you have magnetic field and electrical field, the particle will move. If you have a moving particle and a magnetic field, electricity will be produced. So if you have two of them, the third one is bound to happen. That's how your uh, electromagnetism actually works, right? That's what electromagnetic induction is all about. Now, the in, in electromagnetic induction, you guys are dealing with two topics. You're dealing with the motor effect and you are dealing with the generator effect, okay? When we talk about our motor effect and generator effect, so in the difference between the two of them is that in the motor effect, you are providing the movement. You're providing the magnetic field. You're providing the movement. You're providing the magnetic field. And uh, uh, I'm so sorry. You're providing the electrical field and you're providing the magnetic field in the motor effect. In the motor effect, you're providing the electricity. You're providing the magnetic field. What is the result? Whenever you have two of them, you will get the third. What is the third? Movement. So if I apply electrical field and I apply the magnetic field, I will see movement. My particles will start to move and my motor will start to rotate. In a generator, what happens? I will give the magnetic field. I will give the movement. But what will be the result? Electricity will be produced. Right? So whenever you have two of the things, the third one will form. 
And that's exactly what Faraday's law is all about. If I take any wire, I move it across a magnetic field. What will happen? That electrical current will be generated. I take any wire. It's not connected to any power supply. You guys can try this at home. Take any wire, move it between a magnetic field. You will you can connect it to an emitter to check if the electrical current is, uh, is formed. And you will see that the emitter is going to give you a value, right? So that is electromagnetic induction. What is happening that voltage is being induced in the wire due to the cutting of magnetic field lines, right? Between my two magnets, I have my magnetic field lines. If you guys remember, between the North Pole and the South Pole, the magnetic field lines go from North to South. So as I take a piece of wire and I move it. So see, I have provided with the magnetic field, right? And then I need to provide with movement as well. So you need to take the wire and you need to move it perpendicularly okay don't move it parallelly move it perpendicularly move it up and down so you will see that the wire will uh, a voltage will be induced in the wire a voltage will be induced in the wire why is the voltage being induced in the wire due to the fact that as you move the wire it is cutting the magnetic field lines it is cutting those magnetic field lines, right? So voltage is being induced because the wire is cutting the magnetic field lines. Why is it important for, okay, keep in mind that it's not necessary that you move the wire. You can move the magnetic field if, you, if that is possible. If you can move the magnetic field, you can move the magnetic field. But the magnetic, but one of the things have to be changing, right? If you have the wire stationary, magnetic field is stationary, nothing will happen. Either you need to move the wire or you need to have a changing magnetic field, right? Regardless of whatever the uh, situation is, if you have a movement of a wire in a magnetic field, what is going to happen? The wire is going to cut the electrical field lines. And as it is going to cut the electrical field lines, voltage is going to be induced in the wire. The reason I'm going over the statement again and again is because you get questions where they ask you to explain the principle of electromagnetic induction. If you do not include the relevant terminologies, you are not going to get the marks. You have to talk about the cutting of the magnetic field lines. You have to talk about voltage being or EMF being induced, right? Now, so when this is what electromagnetic induction is, that if I take any wire and move it in a magnetic field or I place it in a changing magnetic field, it will cut the magnetic field lines and as a result, voltage will be induced. Now, there are three factors that can affect the amount of voltage. How much voltage is being induced depends upon three things. It depends upon the speed of the movement, how fast you move the wire or how fast you move the magnetic field. It depends upon the number of turns. So if you, for example, instead of placing one wire, you decide to place a coil, right? That coil will actually experience a higher voltage than one single piece of wire. So it depends upon the number of turns. The greater the number of turns of the wire, the higher the voltage that it's going to experience. And then it depends upon the strength of the magnet. The stronger your magnet is going to be, the greater the voltage is going to be induced, right? So these are the three factors that can affect the amount of voltage that is being induced. Now, when we talk about electromagnetic induction, so electromagnetic induction is really important if we uh, talk about our generator effect because this is exactly what generator is all about. We are producing electricity. Voltage is being induced in the wire. To do that, we need a magnetic field and we need a wire that is moving. 
So let's go ahead and take a look at what happens to our generator effect. So in a generator effect, when we are going to go ahead and talk about it, what actually happens is this, that I take a coil, okay? I take a coil and I go ahead, in fact, hold on. Yes, I take a coil and I place that coil in a magnetic field. Then this coil is connected to a small motor, okay? That motor is going to be rotated rotating the coil in the magnetic field. As the coil is going to rotate in the magnetic field, the coil is, is made up of wire, right? The wire is going to cut the magnetic field lines. And it's going to cut the magnetic field lines, voltage will be induced in the wire. And that voltage is, is the one that we actually use uh, in our generators. This is how a generator basically works. So a current is going to be connect is going to be induced in the wire and then the wire will of course connect to your appliances, to your houses, wherever you require it to be. So how does the process work? To understand how the process works, we need to go over something that is known as uh, Fleming's uh, uh, right hand rule. Okay. So what is uh, Fleming's right-hand rule? When we talk about Fleming's right-hand rule, to understand this, you guys uh, take a look at the position of the hand. It's really, really, really important that you guys take a look at the position of the hand, okay? Whenever you guys are applying the Fleming's rule, whether it's left hand or right hand, I'll teach you the left hand as well. Always remember that you have to open your fingers in exactly this position, meaning that the thumb and the index finger will be perpendicular to each other like this. And then the second finger will come like this. Okay. Please do not open it with the thumb up and then the second finger is coming straight out and then the first finger is perpendicular. Right, that will always give you incorrect results. The reason I'm emphasizing it is because I've seen students make that mistake. Right, the finger, first finger and the thumb will be perpendicular to each other. So it's sort of like making a gun with your hands. And then the second finger is going to act at 90 degrees to you. Okay, the thumb will tell you the movement. So the thumb is always going to correspond to the direction of the movement. Okay, the First finger always corresponds to the direction of the magnetic field. The second finger always corresponds to the direction of the current. Okay. Second finger tells you the direction of the current. First finger tells you direction of magnetic field and the thumb tells you the direction of the movement. Please, please, please always make sure you always open your hand in this exact position. If you change how you open your hand, it will affect your answers. Now, if I go ahead and consider the diagram that is with me, let's see if we can figure out exactly what is the direction of the current that is being produced. Okay, do this with me, please. While I'm doing it, do it with me. For the generator, we always use the right hand. What are you guys going to remember? For the generator, we always use the right hand. What are you going to do? Open up your hand in exactly the position I showed you. Thumb upwards. The first finger is going to be uh, at uh, pointing straight out. And the second finger is going to be bent at 90 degrees. Okay. After you guys have opened your hand like this, what are you going to do? We are going to take a look at the movement. Okay. So over here, you can see that we are dealing with uh, our clockwise movement. Okay. So in a clockwise moment, this is what a clockwise moment looks like, right? So this side is going up. 
and this side is going down, right? That's what a clockwise moment is. The we are going in the same direction as the clock. Okay, so this is how the coil is rotating in the magnetic field. Let's talk about how the current is being induced. So this is pointing upwards. So what are we going to go ahead and do? We are going to point our thumb upwards. Then we have the magnetic field. The magnetic field is going from north to south. So it's going towards the other side, right? It's going towards the right side. So you'll have to move your hand uncomfortably a bit, but thumb is pointing upwards, your second finger, right? Your um, first finger should be pointing towards the south pole. Thumb will be pointing upwards. First finger is going to point towards the south pole. So your second finger, where is it pointing? It is pointing into your screen. Your second finger should be pointing into your screen. So the Current is going to be going this way, right? And you can confirm by taking a look at the other side. At the other side, your thumb is going to point downwards, okay? Your, fir your, uh, your um, first finger is going to point towards the right side. So you will have to move your hand quite uncomfortably, but your finger should be pointing out of the screen. Right? Since your finger is going to be pointing out of the screen, so what is going to happen? The current is traveling this way. So you guys should be able to take a look at a generator. One, explain the principle of the generator. So the principle of the generator is that as the coil rotates within the magnetic field lines, it's going to cut the magnetic field line and a voltage is going to be induced. As the voltage is going to be induced, what is going to happen? That your you can figure out the direction of the current by using Fleming's left hand rule. This is the principle behind a generator. Now, we also have a motor. A motor is opposite to a generator. In a generator, I am moving the coil and I am getting, as a result, electricity. In a motor, I will use an electricity to move the coil, okay? So I have electricity, I'm going to be moving the coil, okay? Now, in a motor, what exactly do you need to know? We can solve or we can figure out the direction of movement of a motor. I can tell exactly how a motor is going to move by using Fleming's left-hand rule. So right-hand rule and left-hand rule are exactly the same. They are both exactly the same. And there are no differences except for the hand that you're using, right? So same thing, your thumb is going to be the movement. Your first finger is going to show you the direction of the magnetic fields. And your um, uh, second finger is going to show you the direction of the current, okay? Now, this is to with your left hand. So please remember, right hand is for generator, left hand is for motor. So we know that the current, flow of current, conventional current is from positive to negative, right? Conventional current. We know that electrons go from negative to positive, but conventional current is from positive to negative. So what are you going to go ahead and do? You are going to... Uh, you are going to take a look at your magnetic field first. Your magnetic field is going from north to south, right? So your first finger, remember, now you're using your left hand. Your first finger should point to the south pole. Then you need to point your second finger. Your second finger is pointing towards the screen, okay? Your arrow is going into the screen. So your first finger will point to the right side, uh, to the, sorry, the... This is sort of, uh, one second. Let me just correct the direction of the magnetic field. The magnetic field is from north to south, like this, okay? So we know that the, uh, your, um, 
First finger is going to point in the direction of the current. Your second finger is going to, uh, sorry, the first the second finger is going to point in the direction of the current. So that is into the paper, okay? Your first finger is going to point north to south. So point your first finger north to south first, point it in the, towards the right direction. Your second finger is going to go into the paper. So you will have to flip your hand. You'll flip your hand. Your second finger is going to go into the paper. Your first finger is going to point from north to south. So your thumb is now pointing downwards. So this side will experience a downward force. Similarly, let's take a look at this side. In this side, the current is coming out of the page. Okay. So first finger again goes from north to south. The second finger will point towards you. It's coming outside and the thumb will point upwards. So in this case, you can see this side will experience a downward force. And this side will experience an upward force. So the motor is going to rotate in an anti-clockwise manner. So this is the major difference that you have between your generator effect and between your motor effect. Clear? Any confusion? Anything that anybody wants to ask? Any questions, any queries, any part that is not making sense? No. Okay, all right. Now, another really important thing that you guys should know is your transformers, right? Now, what exactly are your transformer? A transformer is a device that will either allow you to increase the voltage or it will allow you to decrease the voltage, okay? When it comes to transformers, we can have two types of transformers. We can have step up transformers and we can have step down transformers. Step up transformers are those transformers that will take a low voltage and increase it to a higher voltage. So uh, generally, this step up transformers are usually used out of the power station when when the when the power stations produce electrical current they use a step up transformer to increase the amount of voltage this is easy for them to do because one since they have to produce low voltage uh, electricity it saves them up on power and secondly by using a step up transformer they can turn it to a higher voltage electrical current the reason you want it to be at a higher voltage is to minimize uh, minimize um, energy wasted. They don't want there to be any energy wasted as the electrical current travels through the long power lines. Mom?
Dude. Sorry guys, I got disconnected. Okay, so we can have step up transformers and we can have obviously our step down transformers. Okay, now when uh, we're going to go ahead and we are going to talk about it. How does the transformer actually work? What's the principle behind it? So the transformer generally involves a iron piece of iron we call it an iron core and it is going to be wrapped up with uh, two pieces of iron okay one, one side is known as the primary coil while the other side is known as your secondary coil so we have the primary coil and we have the secondary coil now what happens that as the electricity will pass through the primary coil it will produce a magnetic field and as it will produce a magnetic field that magnetic field will pass through the transformer right and it's going for and reach the secondary coil now when the magnetic field will reach the second magnetic field lines and whenever the wire is going to cut the magnetic field lines what is going to happen voltage is going to be induced okay so we have our primary coil and our secondary coil the primary coil is so remember this that when we talk about the primary coil so in cases of primary coil as the primary coil will produce electricity it will also produce a magnetic field that magnetic field is going to go ahead and uh, uh, pass through the iron core to the secondary coil. And as it passes on to the secondary coil, the secondary coil will cut the magnetic field lines and in the process, voltage will be induced in the second coil. Okay. Now, when it comes off to the concept, how does a step up transformer work? How does a step down transformer work? The core concept is this. In a step-up transformer, the secondary coil has a large number of turns. The wire, the number of turns of the wire are really high compared to the primary coil, right? This is what it looks like. The number of turns of the primary coil will be less. The number of turns of the secondary coil will be more. So the voltage induced in the secondary coil will be greater. In a step-down transformer, the... Primary coil will have a greater number of turns and the secondary coil will have a less number of turns. So the voltage will decrease. So the voltage that is being induced depends upon the number of turns of the wire. Okay. What does that mean? That means that we have an equation. This is the equation. The voltage induced in the secondary coil multiplied by voltage induced in the primary coil is equal to the number of turns of the secondary coil multiplied by number of turns of the primary coil. Or we can rearrange it like this. The voltage in the secondary coil divided by the number of turns in the secondary coil is equal to voltage in the primary coil divided by number of turns of the primary coil. Okay? So this is the formula that you guys can use to find out what will be the voltage in the secondary coil based on the number of turns. 
So in your topic of uh, electromagnetic induction, you guys have to be able to explain what Faraday's law is. You guys have to be able to explain exactly what electromagnetic induction is. How does a generator work? How does a um, motor work? And how you can do calculations related to the topic of transform. Uh, any question? Would anybody like to ask anything? Is everything making sense? Ma'am? Yes, go on. Can you, can you just briefly go over the left hand rule once again, if that's not too much to ask? Yeah, yeah definitely, definitely. Okay, so when we talk about your left hand rule, right? So left hand rule and right hand rule are actually exactly the same. The difference is which hand you are going to be using, right? Now, in the left hand rule, again, the thumb is going to be responsible for the direction of the movement. Okay. The first finger is going to tell you what is the direction of the magnetic field. And the second finger is going to be for the direction of the current. We use the left hand rule for a motor. The right hand rule is for a generator. Left hand rule is going to be for a motor. Now, how does the principle work? This is our motor, okay? Now, if you take a look at the current, so the current is going from positive to negative. So I'm just following this arrow, okay? So the current is going from positive to negative, okay? So what we are going to go ahead and do is that first figure out the direction of the current. So you can always tell it from the power supply because the motor obviously works with the help of electricity. Then you need to figure out the direction of the magnetic field. So the magnetic field is going to go from north to south pole. Okay. Now try this with me. Open up your left hand. Right. After you open up your left hand, what are you going to do? You have your first finger. Point your first finger towards the right side. Okay. Then your second finger point. So you can see that my arrow is going inwards, right? It's going into the screen. So your second finger has to go into inside the screen. Do not move your first finger. Your first finger has to stay, stay towards the right side. So when you will, the only way I can do it is if I rotate my hand upside down. If I move my hand upside down, my first finger stays towards the right side. My is going to be pointing downwards. So this side of the coil, this side of the coil, this side will experience a downward force. Then this is the opposite side. In the opposite side, again, take your left hand. The first finger points towards the direction of the magnetic field. So magnetic field is towards the right. So first finger will point towards the right side. The second finger points towards the direction of the current. The current arrow is pointing towards you. It's coming out of the screen. So second finger will point towards you. First finger will point towards the right side. So arrow is going to point upwards. So this side of the coil will experience a downward force. This side of the coil will experience upward force. And as a result, what is going to happen that the coil is going to rotate if we take a look. So it will go up from this side and it will move down from this side, right? So it will move in an anti-clockwise direction. So Fleming's rule, whether the right hand or the left hand, is exactly the same. The second finger is correct. But the right hand you use when you are dealing with a generator and the left hand you will use whenever you're dealing with a motor. Uh, is that a bit more clear now? I hope it's making a bit more sense than before. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. Uh, any questions? Anything that you guys want me to go over again? Let me know. Okay. All right. Great. 
Okay, guys, so we will go ahead and we'll take a 15 minutes break over here. And then, uh, would you guys prefer going over waves or would you guys prefer going over thermal physics? Or would you guys prefer going over any other topic, general physics? What would you guys prefer? Any preference? Mom, is it all right if we uh, say after break? Yeah, definitely. You can go ahead and do that. No problem. All right. So, guys, we'll go ahead. We'll take a 15-minute break and we will resume the session after 15. All right. So uh, when it comes to your nuclear physics, right? In nuclear physics, there are two things that you guys need to consider. One is, of course, the topic of fusion and fission, right? So nuclear fusion and nuclear fission. And then we, it is also related to the concept of radioactivity, radioactive decay. So when uh, we'll take a look at both of them. When we talk about our radioactivity, right? Let's talk about what exactly is radioactivity. Why is it that some uh, substances, some atoms are, uh, uh, you know, go are going to be radioactive while some of them are not? Now, when you talk about inside an atom, right? Inside an atom, what happens that you have different forces that are present. For example, the nucleus is experiencing an attractive force towards the electrons. On the other hand, the electrons are repelling each other. So, so there, there are these forces that are present inside an atom. And these forces are normally balanced, which makes the atom stable. And similarly, inside the nucleus itself, you have a lot of protons, you have a lot of neutrons. Neutrons, okay, fine, they do not carry a charge. But protons carry a positive charge, right? So, they... Uh, inside the nucleus as well, you've got multiple forces that are acting. Now, for a nucleus to be stable, all of these forces need to be balanced out. But in some cases, there can be a imbalance of those forces. For example, if we are dealing with a isotope, right? Isotopes are atoms that have the same number of protons, but different number of neutrons. Please keep in mind that number of protons will remain the same, okay? If the number of proton changes, the element will change. So proton is sort of the identification number of the atom. So it has the same number of protons, but different number of neutrons, okay? So what happens that due to having different number of neutrons, or not just because of different number of neutrons, due to other reasons as well, the nucleus of an atom can become unstable okay so if the nucleus of an atom becomes unstable because like i said we have different forces acting inside the nucleus okay so everything is balanced but when the number of neutron becomes different like for example in an isotope what happens that the balance is disrupted and as a result the nucleus is no longer stable it's an unstable nucleus and since it is unstable, it will start to break down and it will start to decay. All right. Now, that decay, the breakdown of nucleus is what we call as radioactivity. There are two things you guys have to understand about radioactivity. Radioactivity is random and spontaneous. What do we mean by spontaneous and random? That we cannot predict when radioactivity will start. You cannot, I cannot look at radioactive material and tell you this material is going to start producing radioactive particles within one year. No, you cannot tell exactly when it is going to start decaying, right? So it's spontaneous. It happens by itself and it's completely random. But we can predict uh, that once radioactive decay starts, how will it happen? How long, how, how, how will the decay occur? That we can predict, right? Now, first of all, let's talk about how does radioactive decay occur. Radioactive decay occur with the production of 
uh, three types of, or basically you guys are studying three types. There can be more as well. Three types of uh, particles, okay? Not particles, but um, uh, it can decay in three possible ways, okay? Now, the nucleus can either decay to give you an alpha particle or it can decay to give you a beta particle or it can decay to give you your gamma radiation. Your gamma radiation is an electromagnetic wave. All right. Now, when the when we talk about alpha radiation, what is an alpha particle? An alpha particle is a particle that has four is the total mass number. It has two protons and two neutrons. Okay. So an alpha particle is simply a particle that has two protons and it has two neutrons. Okay. That's what an alpha particle actually is. It is similar to the nucleus of a helium. If you take a look at the nucleus of a helium, it will also have uh, two protons and two neutrons. Now, an alpha particle, whenever we talk about radiation, we need to consider few things. We need to consider its ionizing power. We need to consider its penetrating power. And we need to consider the range. An alpha particle is a highly ionizing particle. What does that even mean? What that means is that when alpha particle is traveling through any air, it's traveling through any medium, it's traveling through water, any substance, it will interact with the particles in its way and it is going to ionize them. It is going to ionize them and turn them into ions. Hence, we say that it has got high ionizing power. But since it is going to be interacting with all the particles in its path, it's going to be ionizing them. It's going to be turning them into ions. It will lose energy, right? When it's going to be interacting with all those particles, it's going to be losing energy in the process. When it's going to lose energy in the process, what is going to happen? it will slow down and it will stop. So alpha particles, when it comes to ionizing power, they have high ionizing power, but their penetrating power is quite low. Why? Because obviously they are not able to travel that far. You put even a single piece of paper in front of them, it's more than enough to stop. A single piece of paper is more than enough to stop the alpha radiation exactly in its path. Why? Because it will instantly lose all its energy and stop moving. And the range of alpha particles are quite small. Alpha particles do not travel a great distance. Then we have beta radiation. Now, when it comes to beta radiation, in beta radiation is basically fast moving electrons. We have fast moving electrons and those fast moving electrons are the are basically what we consider to be our beta particles. Okay, so when a nucleus breaks down and after breaking down, it releases a fast moving electron that is known as beta radiation. Okay, a beta particle has a mass of zero and it has a charge of minus one because it does not have any protons, right? It has one electron. So it has a charge of minus one. When it comes to ionizing power, so beta particle is less ionizing compared to alpha particle. Alpha particle has very high ionizing power. Beta particle has is somewhere in the middle. It, it's less than alpha particle. It has less alpha uh, ionizing power than your alpha particles, right? And when it comes to penetration, so a beta particles can penetrate a greater, um, a, a greater distance than alpha particles. So, for example, a beta particle will easily pass through a piece of paper, but it can be stopped with a sheet of aluminium. Okay, so it's moderate. It has moderate ionizing power. It has moderate penetrating power. It can penetrate through a piece of paper, but not through a sheet of aluminum. And it has moderate range. 
Now, when it comes to gamma radiation, so gamma radiation is not a particle. It's an electromagnetic wave. And since it is an electromagnetic wave, obviously, it does not have any mass and it does not have any charge. It does not interact with the pathway of electricity with the substances in its pathway, right? It does not interact with them. It's not going to interact with any atoms. It's not going to interact with any molecules. It will just keep minding its own business. So what is going to happen? That they are weakly ionizing. They're not going to interact with any atoms. They're not going to be ionizing any atoms. They're simply going to be traveling through without any interaction whatsoever. So obviously, since they're not interacting with any particles, they will not lose their energy as well. So they can penetrate through almost every material and they have a very long range. You need something really thick like lead to stop them from passing through. Now, another important thing that you guys should be able to do, and this is related to Fleming's uh, uh, hand rule as well, okay? Another thing that you guys should know is what happens when I take alpha, beta, and gamma particles and I put them in magnetic field and in electrical fields. Now, in electrical fields, it is quite easy to understand. If I take an it will move towards the negative plate. Why? Because alpha particle is positive and the plate is negative. So it is going to be attracted. On the other hand, when we talk about the beta particle, the beta particle, so it is going to be attracted towards the positive plate. Now, notice something quite interesting. Do you see how the alpha particle has a small curved pathway, but the beta particle has a wide curved pathway? Right? If you take a look at the curve, so beta particle has a different curve. Alpha particle has a smaller curve. The reason for that is because alpha particle has a charge of 2 plus because it has two protons. So it has a charge of 2 plus. Beta particle has a charge of minus 1. So since alpha particle has a greater charge, it experiences a greater force. So it will curve more. Okay. Gamma particle on the other hand will pass through the electrical field without any deviation. Then we can also take alpha, beta, and gamma particles and put them into a magnetic field. What is going to happen? For over here now, you have to use your Fleming's rule. Okay? Tell me one thing. Take a look at the information we have. We have magnetic fields and we have uh, charged particles that are moving. Should I use left-hand rule or should I use right-hand rule? What should I use? What do you guys think? Left-hand. Yes, you'll use the left-hand rule because you have a charged particle that's moving, that's current, okay? And you have the magnetic field. We want to find out the direction of the force, so we will use left-hand rule, okay? Now, let's try for the alpha particle. Open your hand in exactly the way I taught you guys. Your first finger is going to be pointing. Uh, your first finger is going to be pointing towards your screen, right? Because the magnetic field is acting into the page. So we're going to point it towards into the page, okay? Now, your second finger. Where should you point your second finger? Towards the right or towards the left? What do you guys think? Right? Yes, you'll point it towards the right. So your thumb will point upwards, right? So the alpha particle should deviate upwards. Now, come to the beta particle. Again, your magnet second finger, sorry, first finger is going to be pointing into the page, right? Because the magnetic field is into the page. What about your second finger? Should your second finger point towards the right or the left? Would it be right? It would be left. And I'll tell you why. This is exactly why I wanted to go over this with you. There is a reason for that. Now, over here, you guys remember that we can have we have conventional current, right? 
we know okay so we know now days in our physics we know quite clearly that electrical current is the movement of electrons right electrons go from the negative terminal to the uh positive terminal but before scientists knew about electrons before scientists knew about the uh, that electrons are the ones that are responsible for flow of current they used to believe that current was the flow of positive particles right so for a really long time, the scientists thought that current is from positive to negative terminal. That's what they thought. That it's from positive to negative terminal, right? That's what we call as our conventional current. We know it's because of electrons, but they thought for a very long time that current is from positive to negative. This is known as conventional current. Even nowadays, even though we are so far advanced in terms of technology, even nowadays in your exams, you'll see quite often they'll ask you the direction of conventional current and it will be positive to negative, right? So now using that logic, this will make more sense. For the alpha particle, the alpha particle is the, the, uh, uh, the conventional current is from positive towards negative, okay? So alpha particle is positively charged so the current will be in the same direction as the alpha particle but beta particle is negatively charged so the current for beta particle is towards the positive side it's going to be towards the left and now when you take your left hand rule your first finger is going to point into your screen your second finger is going to point towards the left side. So you will have to flip your hand upside down to do that. Your thumb will point downwards. So the beta particle is moving downwards, right? Alpha particle will move upwards. Why? Everything is because of the direction of current. For alpha particle, you'll take current to be in the same direction as the alpha particle. For beta particle, because beta particle is negatively charged, and Fleming's rule is based on conventional current, okay? That's why we have to use conventional current. So beta particle, if you follow conventional current, beta particle, for beta particle, the direction should be towards the left side, right? Because conventional current is, is from positive to negative. So it should be towards the other side. So we will take our second finger towards the left side. So first finger points in, second finger towards the left, for uh, thumb points downwards. So alpha particle will deflect upwards, beta particle will deflect downwards, and gamma particle, because it has no mass and it has no charge, it will travel in a straight line, right? Making sense exactly how uh, uh, why your beta alpha particle is going up and why the beta particle is deflecting down? Yeah. Okay, great. Okay, now when we are going to go ahead and we are going to talk about it, Another important thing that you guys should know is your half-life calculations, okay? We can, uh, what is half-life? Half-life is the time taken for the cons for the uh, amount of your, or for the nucleus to decay by half, okay? Half-life is the time taken for the nucleus to decay by half. So, when we talk about our half-life, right? What does that mean? Let's say that we have over here 100. The 100 is the count, radioactivity count. Okay. So if I want to find the first half life, what will I do? Half of, so I'll do 100 divided by 2. I'll get 50. So I will look in my graph and I will read how long does it take for the time to become or how long does it take for the, for the decay to half, for the nucleus to decay to 50. So let's say we get 10 minutes. Then again, you can find the second half life. The second half life again is going to be time taken for it to go from half of 50. Now you will take half of 50. So half of 50 is 25. Now this half life is usually constant. So it will take 10 minutes again, right? Then for the third half life, you will now do half of 25. So 12.5. And that's how you are going to go ahead and do your half-life 
calculations. Now, if you take a look at the curve, you'll see that the curve we're getting, this is known as an exponential curve. What is an exponential curve? An exponential curve is a mathematical curve that almost never touches, it does, it, it, it does not touch zero. That is the reason why it is really, 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 really hard to tell when radioactivity will stop. Because even if the amount of radioactivity is 0 0.0001, it can still decrease by half and become 0 0.00005, right? So it's a curve that technically never really touches zero. It will get very close to it, but it doesn't touch zero. So same thing is true for radioactivity. We can never tell when you reach zero, right? Now, uh, this is the kind of questions you guys are going to encounter in your past papers. The activity of a sample uh, is found to be 200. If the isotope has a half-life of 20 minutes, what will the activity of the sample be after one hour? Okay, so let's find out. We know that the initial activity is 200. From 200, if we do half, we get 100, right? This will take 20 minutes. Then, from again, if we uh, continue, right? So, we have to find out the level of activity after three hours, basically, okay? So, for 20 minutes, the activity will become 200, okay? Then, in the second half-life, it will reduce again. It will go from 100 to 50, which will again take 20 minutes. Then, it will go from 50 to 25, which will again take 20 minutes. So, so far, we are at 60 minutes, right? This is in one hour. In one hour, it has come down to 25. Then, let's resume from 25. From 25, half of 25 is 12.5. This will again take 20 minutes. Then, the, the in another 20 minutes, the concentration is, or I'm saying concentration, excuse me, the count is going to half again, right? So, it will be 12.5 divided by 2, 6.25. This will take another 20 minutes. Then, after 6.25 again, if we go ahead and divide by 2, we get 3.125. So after another 20 minutes, it will be at 3.125. So now we are at 2 hours. This was 1 hour. This is now 2 hours. 20 plus 20 plus 20 gives us 60 minutes. Now let's find out what will happen in the third hour. 3.125. After 20 minutes, it will become 1.56. Okay, then after another 20 minutes, it's going to be 0 0.78. After another 20 minutes, you will get 0 0.39, right? So you guys can see, you guys can see that technically it's getting closer to zero, but you guys can actually keep on doing divide, 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 but technically the value will never really get to zero, okay? So after, you can take a look that after your three hour amount, it has gone from a count of 200 to a count of 0 0.39. So that is how you're going to be. Uh, so that is how you're going to be solving questions related to your half-life calculations. Okay, now another portion that you guys are going to see in your nuclear physics, uh, I don't know uh, if you guys are part of the Dexel or the Cambridge uh, batch. I think it's uh, in the Cambridge uh, board there, it's in a, uh, you have to do it in a bit of detail. So when you talk about your nuclear physics, right? In your nuclear physics, okay, this is something very interesting. You guys must have heard of this equation before, right? E is equals to mc squared. It's a very interesting equation. Uh, when you guys do your A-levels, you guys will actually study this. It's quite interesting, okay? What is E equals to MC square all about? This is something that's not a part of your syllabus, but it's something, if you guys like physics, you'll enjoy studying about it. Uh, Einstein has basically stated that if you take your particles, 
and you accelerate them to the speed of light. Okay. So what happens that energy and mass are interconvertible? What does that mean? That means, so uh, uh, what that basically means is that if uh, uh, you uh, take a particle and you accelerate it, you increase the speed to the speed of light, okay? So you might notice that the mass has decreased. Why? So, so that was the scientists were wondering, why is the mass decreasing? Why, why is it that the mass is decreasing? So the reason the mass was decreasing is because the mass of the object was converting into energy. Right? So that is what Einstein's equation state, that particles, when they travel at the speed of light, the energy can convert into mass and mass can convert into energy. So in, if I, if I, uh, so in some, uh, so th 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 that would explain because the uh, question that the scientists were wondering was that when nuclear fission or nuclear uh, fusion would occur, they would sometimes get particles that were larger in size or smaller in size. So they wanted to understand this. So Einstein was the one who found out that when you take particles, you put them to the speed of light. So the mass of the particle can actually convert into energy or the energy of the particle can actually convert into the mass of the particle. So that is what this equation is actually about. Energy is equals to mass multiplied by the speed of light squared. Now, you uh, in A-levels, I teach this topic in a lot of details. So uh, you guys will study it uh, when you do your A-levels. Now, there are two things that you guys need to know about in nuclear physics. That's nuclear fusion and nuclear fission. What is nuclear fission? Nuclear fission is the breakdown of a large nucleus into smaller nucleus. Okay, you take a large nucleus and you break it down into smaller nucleus. That is what we call as our fission. Okay, nuclear fission is something that we can easily do in our uh, nuclear power plants. How do we actually do it? So we generally use uh, uh, uranium-235 for this. We take uranium-235 and in the uranium-235, what we normally do is that we shoot a neutron at it. Like we literally shoot it, a neutron towards the uranium-235. What happens that when the uranium neutron hits the nucleus of the uranium, the uranium nucleus becomes unstable. Because it becomes unstable, it breaks. And as it breaks, it will give you, for example, it will give you two smaller nuclei. And along with that, it will produce two more neutrons. And it will also go ahead and give you a la large amount of energy. Now, again, why is it that breaking of a uranium is giving you energy that is, again, related to your, uh, you guys will study in A-levels in detail. Exactly why is it that breaking of a uranium nucleus gives energy? But breaking of a uranium uh, nuclei gives you your uh, two small nuclei and it produces large amounts of energy. Along with that, it also produces neutrons. These two neutrons will then go ahead and attack two more uranium nuclei. Those uranium nuclei will break down and more neutrons will be produced. So it's a chain reaction, right? Now, when we talk about nuclear fusion, right? Nuclear fusion is when you take two small nuclei and you join them together to make a larger nuclei. These two small nuclei, when we go ahead and we talk about it, uh, they will join together to give you a larger nuclei and in the process, they release a huge amount of energy. Now, what happens is this, that this is something that we cannot do, at least we cannot do right now. We do not have any way of doing a controlled nuclear fusion. We can do it, but we don't have any way of controlling it. Okay? This is something that occurs quite regularly on your stars, your sun, right? Your stars. In fact, you guys do have the topic of space physics, astrophysics in your syllabus. So you guys must have studied in the life cycle of a star what happens, that two of the nuclei join together to give you a larger nuclei. So in the stable stage, you generally have hydrogen atoms joining together to give you helium. Then 
after the stable stage is over, what is going to happen? The uh, hydrogen will run out. So the star shifts onto helium, right? In the process, as it shifts onto helium, because helium produces larger amounts of energy, so the star tends to expand and it becomes the red giant that you studied about. So fusion is something that generally occurs in the stars. We do not have a way of doing controlled nuclear fusion so far, okay? Now, what happens in nuclear fusion that you can take two nuclei and you can join them together to give you a larger nuclei. But for this reaction to happen, we need to provide a huge amount of heat energy. Providing that huge amount of heat, heat energy and um, uh, providing the right conditions, again, is something that we cannot do. So nuclear fusion is something that is not done commonly. In fact, it's not, we don't do it, okay? So, uh, uh, or at least control nuclear fusion, we can't do it. So nuclear fission is the one that is actually used for your uh, production of nuclear energy. And that is all you guys need to know regarding your topic of nuclear physics. So now let's go ahead and do one thing. Let's go ahead and take a look at a few questions. Just generally, let me go over some tips and tricks of how you guys are going to go about solving your questions. Okay. Let's go ahead and take a look at that. What kind of questions will you see in your past papers? And how can we go ahead and how can we solve them? Okay, so let's go ahead again, solve the question with me. Let's solve it together. The question says, figure 7.1 shows a circuit that contains a battery, a switch, a voltmeter, 340 ohm resistors. This switch is open and resistors R1 and R2 form a potential divide. Now, describe what is meant by potential divider please do not let the terminology do not let the wording confuse you it is nothing uh, that you guys do not know a potential divider circuit is simply a circuit that is connected in series with each other so if i take a uh, two resistors and i connect them in series with each other you guys know in a series circuit, voltage is divided. So that is exactly what is happening over here, okay? In a potential divider circuit, you have two resistors that are arranged in series with each other. And since they are arranged in series with each other, so the voltage is going to be divided across the two resistors. So that is a potential divider circuit. Simply put, it is when you have two resistors connected in series with each other. And the voltage is divided across the two resistors. Then, if we take a look at what they're asking next, they're saying the reading on the voltmeter is 7.5 volts. Calculate the EMF of the battery. Would you like to, uh, would somebody like to attempt it? What do you guys think? How can I figure out the EMF of the battery? This is the information. By the way, this is just for one mark, so it's a pretty easy question. What do you guys think? What will I do that will allow me to calculate the EMF of the battery? For one mark, you do not need to do any complicated calculations, nothing like that. So you guys, can you see that over here, we have these two resistors, right? They're connected in series with each other. So you know that the voltage is going to be divided, right? 
we don't have to worry about R3 and R2 because they are in parallel. So since R3 and R2 are in parallel with each other, the voltage will remain the same. So we have to worry about R1 and R2. Now, the good thing is that all three resistors have the same resistance. They both have 40 ohm resistance. Okay. So if the current in R1 is 7.5, right? The current in the R2 resistor will be the same. It will also be 7.5. Okay. So 7.5 plus 7.5 gives you a total of 15 volts, right? So the EMF of the battery is simply put 15 volts. Then they're saying the switch is closed. Calculate the resistance of the complete circuit, okay? So let's calculate total resistance. What do you guys think? How should we go ahead and calculate the total resistance? First thing is first, you can see that these two resistors are in parallel to each other. The major circuit, the bigger circuit is the series circuit, okay? These two resistors are in parallel to each other. So what are we going to do? We are going to take, first thing is first, solve the small circuit, solve the parallel circuit. So you will do one upon 40 plus one upon 40. So that's going to give you the value of 20, right? 1 upon 40 plus 1 upon 40 gives you 2 upon 40. And if you reciprocate it, because remember, this is the answer for 1 upon R, you'll get 40 upon 2, which gives you 20. Now, this combined is 20 ohms. Now you can solve the series circuits. So 20 plus 40 ohms is going to give you a total of 60 ohms. Then they're saying calculate the reading on the voltmeter when the switch is closed. So when the switch is closed, we have to calculate what is going to be the reading on the voltmeter, right? So uh, uh, when we go ahead and we're going to talk about it, let's see if we can figure it out. What should be the reading on the voltmeter when this switch is closed? Now, when the switch is closed, you can say, miss, it should not make any difference because the volt R3 and R2 are in parallel with each other. They resist the, the voltage should be the same. Now, the problem that will happen is that when I close the switch, the resistance of this side will increase, right? Because now the resistance of R3 is also there. So resistance of this side is going to increase. Initially, if I don't close the switch, the resistance is only 40 ohms, right? But when I close the switch, the resistance decreases to 20 ohms. So that will affect the voltage that is going through R2. So how are we going to go ahead and how are we going to figure this out? Now, the way you're going to uh, go ahead and you are going to figure this out is, you guys know that you guys know that the current is the same, right? You guys know that the current is going to be the same. So we know, let's say, voltage in resistor 1 is equals to current multiplied by resistor 1. Voltage in resistor 2 is equal to current multiplied by resistor 2. We can rearrange the equation to make current the subject. So V1 upon R1 is equals to I and V2 upon R2 is equal to I, okay? So current is the same, so we can make them both equal to each other. V1 upon R1 is equals to V2 upon R2. So now we can go ahead and we can calculate the value. Right, so uh, we know that our R2 is 20 ohms and one second. Mm. We know that our R2 is 20 ohms, right? So let's write down 
20 upon V2 is equals to V1 and R1, the resistance is 40. So let's take out the ratio V1 upon V2 cross multiply, right? So V1 upon V2 is equals to 40 upon 20 or V1 upon V2 is equals to 2. So you know that the voltage going in V1 is twice the voltage going in R2, right? The voltage going to resistor 1 is two times the voltage going to resistor 2. So now what are we going to go ahead and do? One second, let me make some space. We know that the total EMF is, we, what did we calculate? That the EMF of the battery is 15, right? So uh, we are going to go ahead and calculate. So let's say that the uh, voltage going to resistor R, R2 is X, right? Now, remember we got a ratio of 2, 2 upon 1. V1 is 2 times V2. So if this is X, this must be 2X. In a series circuit, if we add up the voltage, it should be equal to the total voltage. So X plus 2X is equal to 15. 15 is the EMF of the battery. 3X is equal to 15. X is equal to 5. So the voltage going to R2 is 5 and the voltage going to R1 is 2 fives are 10. So we managed to calculate it for both R1 and R2. They asked us to calculate for R1, but I calculated for R2 as well to show you guys how we approach questions like this. Okay, so this is how you guys are going to go ahead and solve your questions. Any part that did not make sense, any confusion, anything that you guys want to ask, No. All right, great. Okay, guys, so I think we'll go ahead and we will stop it over here for today. I hope this session was useful for you guys. I hope it helps you out with your exams. I'm inshallah praying that you guys are going to do really well in your exams. I hope you guys score really, really, really good marks. Uh, please go ahead and do remember to sign up for our resource center. That's where all the lectures are going to be uploaded even uh, as basically a gift from our side, we have also gone ahead and uh, we are going to give you the access to all of the chapters that you got, we, you know, the entire syllabus, past paper practice, everything, you'll be given access for a whole month to help you guys prepare, prepare for your exam. Please note down the website, please note down the number for any queries that you guys might have. And we are starting our next batches as well. Uh, if for May, June 2025, we're starting in August. For January, February, we're starting in June. So go ahead, sign up because obviously we have such little time. I cannot go over the topics in detail with you guys. Normally in the class, we have so much fun. We go over the theory. We practice solving questions. It is fun. It is interactive. We're all joking and talking to each other. So I really hope I'll see you guys again for my uh, sessions that are starting soon for A-level exams. And we have very limited seats. We only take three students per batch. So we don't take more than that. So we have very limited seats. So I really hope you guys will join up. And best of luck from my side for your exams. Inshallah, inshallah, inshallah. I know you guys are going to do a very, very good job. And I really hope this session was useful for you guys. And you will like the class.